Good evening, this is Brass Tax. I'm Zakhar Jacob. The clash of the line of actual control in Yangtze between India and Chinese troops. It's the latest in a series and a new pattern of incursions that we've been seeing from Galwan in 2020. Soldiers engaged in unsophisticated weapons like clubs and sticks and machetes having a go at each other almost like it's a hostile flight. Now this video that you're seeing on the right of your screen, this is an undated, it's an unverified video. It's viral on the internet. CNN News 18 cannot independently confirm the authenticity or the veracity of it. It did happen between Indian and Chinese troops. We don't know when it happened. It is most likely not from the latest clash in Tawang. But more than that, it does raise the very, very serious question. This is not what soldiers are trained for. This is not what soldiers on a hot border should be indulging in. Soldiers are trained for war. They are trained to use their weapons against the enemy. They are trained to protect and defend every inch of their territory, not for some hostile or high school fist fight as this has turned out to be. But the reason why this has descended into fisticuffs is because one party, in this case China, has unilaterally, singularly and deliberately tried to change the status quo. They want to grab land, they want to press their claims in a violent, aggressive fashion, and they are doing so by using stealth, by using almost Neanderthal weapons like clubs and sticks. So if this is a part of a pattern from Galwan in 2020 to Tawang in 2022, then how should India be ready for such a new kind of warfare? And how should India be seen as responding to this new warfare? All right, and later on in the show, I'll be speaking to Chicago University professor John Mearsheimer, one of the uh, most renowned scholars in foreign policy here uh, in the United States. Uh, I will be asking him, why does this happen with China time and time again? What is China's real motive? And what can India do to impose costs on this behavior and get China to change its rather aggressive behavior on the line of actual control? But first, the story. Absolute pandemonium in parliament for the second straight day over the India-China skirmish in Arunachal Pradesh. Despite a statement from the defence minister, the opposition staged a walkout from both houses after they were refused a discussion on the issue. Bharat and China, which is going to be April 2020, उसपे एक बार भी संसद में चर्चा नहीं हुई। चीन क्यों तनाव बढ़ा रहा है सरहद के ऊपर? इसके लिए संसद में एक व्यापक चर्चा की जरूरत है। Why Parliament was kept away from this information? China is the state country which cannot be trusted. We have experienced it. हिंदी चीनी भाई भाई। From that day onwards, we are experiencing China's very, 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 uh, they, they are invaders. Oh. They are invaders. While the face-off at the LAC has divided Indian politics, the international community has taken a stand. The US has sent a stern and unambiguous message to China. It does reflect, though, uh, and it's important to point out, the, the growing trend by uh, the PRC to uh, assert itself. Uh, and to be provocative. We are glad to hear that both sides appear to have quickly uh, disen disengaged from the clashes. Uh, we are closely monitoring the situation. We encourage India and China to utilize existing bilateral channels uh, to discuss disputed boundaries. More than two years after the deadly Galwan clashes, China tried to repeat it in Tawang. Around 3 in the morning on the 9th of December, 300 Chinese troops tried to capture icy heights around Yangtze. Capturing the heights would have given them visibility of up to 25 to 30 kilometers. Hence, there's no need for patrolling in the harsh winter months. But Indian troops stood their ground and sent the People's Liberation Army packing to their posts. <laughs> और उन्हें उनकी पोस्ट पर वापस जाने के लिए मजबूर कर दिया अध्यक्ष महोदय इस झड़प में दोनों ओर के कुछ सैनिकों को चोटें भी आई हैं और मैं इस सदन को अवगत कराना चाहता हूं कि हमारे किसी भी सैनिक की न तो मृत्यु हुई है 
और न ही कोई गंभीर रूप से घायल हुआ है China first tried to downplay the incident and then played the victim card, accusing India of illegally crossing over. To our knowledge, at the moment, the Chinese Foreign Ministry is overall calm. The two sides have been in contact with foreign ministers and foreign ministers to maintain a peaceful dialogue. We hope that the Chinese and the Indian government will follow the common goal of securing the two leaders. We will adhere to the common goal of securing the two leaders. We will adhere to the common goal of securing the two leaders. With China's duplicity completely exposed. How should India respond? All right, we have breaking news coming in just days after the skirmish that happened in Tawang. Now, Indian Air Force planes uh, will be flying over that eastern sector. It's going to be a command level exercise over almost all of the northeastern states. This will help check the readiness of the aircraft under the Eastern Command. Remember, uh, the IAF had scrambled jets. In the run-up to what happened in Tawang and in the immediate aftermath, the notice has been issued to airmen in Arunachal Pradesh for the 15th and 16th of December. That's tomorrow and the day after. This is a pre-planned exercise in which fighter jets, helicopters, and unmanned aerial vehicles will be taking part of all the structures within the Eastern Command uh, in Arunachal as well as other northeastern states. Let me go across uh, to my colleague Akash, who's joining us live from Tawang. Uh, Akash, first things first. This was, yes, a pre-planned air operation or air exercise, as it were, but it assumes significance, doesn't it, in the aftermath of what's happened in Tawang last week. Exactly, and Zaka, you know, this is why, you know, in fact, uh, Indian Air Force officials are, you know, coming out in public and saying that, you know, this is our routine practice. But having said that, we know that for the next two days, this important exercise is going to happen. And, you know, this is a command-level exercise, Zaka, and we have been given to understand that under Eastern Command, you cover the LAC as well. And, you know, we have been given to understand that in this exercise, you'll be having your fighter jets, fighter planes, you'll be having your helicopters and also the UAVs. Now, why UAVs are important, Zaka? Because, you know, we have seen in the past that how China you know, is sending its UAVs to the actual line of control. How from, you know, uh, 16th November to 25th November, as far as our sources are concerned. So they, they are confirming the dates and they are telling us that how, you know, during these dates, these UAVs were sent to Indian boundaries. In fact, the airspace was violated. And this was the time when Indian Air Force had to scramble uh, the, the Sukhoi jet. Also, you know, Zaka, this is important uh, because this is a two days exercise. Yes, on one hand, you have a claim that this is a routine exercise. But again, this is to check your readiness. This is to check your check that how much you are prepared. And, you know, Indian officers, Indian Air Force officers, in fact, are telling us that, uh, you know, in fact, China is preparing. And this is why this exercise is going to be very, very important. Tejpur Air Force Station, Guwahati Air Force Station and some other nearby Air Force stations are likely to be a part of this exercise. As you rightly mentioned, a notice has been issued to the airmen and specifically for the Arunachal Pradesh region that, you know, uh, no one else can use the airspace on that particular day because for the next two days, we are going to see this important exercise of the Indian Air Force. All right, Akash, uh, we'll leave it at that. We'll see how this story plays out. I just want to get a quick word from you uh, in Tawang, uh, just before we let you go, just 30 seconds. How is this story playing out? We do see skirmishes. It's not a new thing. It's not the first time that Indian and Chinese troops have had, you know, this kind of fisticuffs and so on. But are people surprised by, A, the gravity of it, the nature of it, the depravity of it? And, and most importantly, I'm sure people there in Tawang and other places are wondering, how do we deal with this? If this is a new normal... What, what's the modus operandi? How does India respond? So, first of all, you know, I had a word with several people here. They're not worried at all. In fact, they're confident. In fact, they're confident, Zaka, and they are saying that whatever they have seen in the past five to six years, you know, it is somewhere showing that India is all ready for such challenges. And also, you know, just a few minutes back, I had a word with one shopkeeper here in Tawang, and, you know, he categorically said that he trusts whatever Rajnath Singh said in the parliament. And, you know, as far as uh, the count is concerned, so they have a different theory going on. They say that, uh, you know, in fact, this, uh, this number six is a fake theory. You know, uh, we had only three to four Jawans injured and the injuries are far more on the other side. So as far as people are concerned, so they are fully confident and, you know, they have some sort of trust on Indian army as well. And okay. they are not in fear at all.
All right, Akash, we'll leave it at that. Uh, we'll see uh, more and more reports. Look forward to seeing that from you uh, there in Tawang, Ground Zero. Let me now bring in our uh, guests who are joining us. Shazia Elmi, spokesperson of the BJP. Lieutenant Colonel Anil Duhun is spokesperson of the Congress Party. Lieutenant General Retired Raj Gardian is former Vice Chief of the Indian Army. Uh, Rajiv Dogra, former diplomat. Professor Brahma Chalani, strategic affairs ex expert, is joining us. And Victor Gao is uh, chair professor at the Sucho University and former Chinese diplomat. Uh, let me start with the political spokespersons first. Shazia Elmi, the question that's being asked is, forget about you know, what the Congress is saying about Parliament being left in the dark and why does this keep happening again and again. The point is, from Galwan 2020 to Tawang 2022, it's very clear, and this video that we have, which is undated and unverified, but we're given to understand it's between 2020 Galwan and 2022 Tawang, seems to raise the prospect that this is a new normal. This is a new strategy being adopted by the Chinese PLA what is India doing about it? Not, a, not just at the on-ground military level. What are we doing about it politically? What are we doing about it economically? What are we doing to counter this strategy? I think um, we all are well aware of the fact that uh, um, India is definitely have, is on a much stronger wicket when it came to even uh, the intelligence of this activity. Uh, that was uh, uh, taking place, uh, skirmishes of the kind that happened. Uh, as far as... Uh, uh, economically is concerned, I think that we all know the answer to that. And I think uh, the world accepts the fact that India is taking over of the presidency of G20. And not just that, this whole uh, China plus one and the idea that China, India can be that destination where more and more countries would like to invest, and especially at the way it is growing. Now, I can go into the details and talk about what is happening with the Chinese economy, what, uh, uh, what the, what, what, how the banks uh, are, are doing and all of that. But coming back to this point, I, I, while I think that um, uh, the, the proof is for everybody to see, uh, as, as, as your report uh, not just suggests, but outlines clearly, the fact is that we're on a, uh, on a good wicket and a strong wicket, ready to meet the challenges. I think the speech given by, uh, and the, uh, the uh, words of Rajnath Singh, our defense minister, are, are, are extremely uh, reassuring, to, to say the least. So I think that's all in very, very good stead where, um, where our policy on China goes. And the fact that uh, uh, whether it's the U.S. or other countries, they are not just rallying around, but are actually uh, taking note of the fact that there has been uh, uh, some provocation uh, 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 from the other side says a lot about um, our, our own vindication. Okay, I, I want to go across to Lieutenant Colonel Anil Dahoon of the Congress Party before we go to our, our experts. Lieutenant Colonel, you know, the point is that this has been a pattern that we have seen, not in this gravity or not in this degree where you're seeing clubs and machetes and sticks being used, but from Depsang in 2013 to Demchok in 2014, uh, even when the UPA was in power, the Chinese have employed these tactics where they are violently, very aggressively pressing their territorial claim, claims along the line of actual control. So, yes, it's one thing to say that, you know, government is keeping the opposition in the dark. How come this is happening? We don't know about it. Media is reporting about it first, but parliament is in session. But not like it was any different when the UPA was in power. Uh, good evening to you and good evening to all listeners and viewers. First thing first, <coughs> I will not start with UPA or BJP or NDA. What I would like to bring out is a similarity. When it happened in June 2020, even that time there was no statement from government. I take it maybe uh, they read the ground realities wrongly and they delayed the statement till that time it came out in the media. Now, it, it was not the case of once bitten and twice shy because when it happened in Arunachal, again for three long days, the parliament in session, the entire government kept quiet. Now, is there a similarity or not? Question is not what uh, Raksha Mantri Rajnath Singh Ji said in Parliament or what Congress is asking for. Question is not that. Question is, was it right to hide it from the public? Let me assure each and every individual who is on the panel and the fellow citizens. Okay. Today, we are all very proud of our Indian Army, of their bravery. We will not get cowed down or bowed down by our neighbors. I would like to bring a very important fact here and that is, can anybody name a battle which the Chinese won decisively? Vis-a-vis -vis 
वी आर दी आर्मी विच इज द मोस्ट बेटल हार्ड एंड आर्मी इन दिस वर्ल्ड ओके वाई आर वी बोइंग डाउन फॉर वॉट जस्ट बिकॉज इक्विपमेंट नंबर्स आर मोर टूवर्स चाइना डज इट मीन दैट द इक्विपमेंट विल विन दम बैटल्स हैड दैट बीन सो रशिया वुड हैव वर्कड ओवर यूक्रेन बाय नाउ दैट इज अ लाइव एग्जाम्पल इन फ्रंट ऑफ अस and as one of the uh, co panelist mentioned about the economic thing let me tell you in 20 uh, 2122 we had import of about 20 billion uh, usd and we had export of 94 uh, sorry uh, other way around import 94 yeah. uh, billion, billion uh, usd what are we talking why are we on a national media why are we trying to uh, i'll not say telling lies but why are we trying to Uh, you know, but not bring out the facts. Okay, I'll, I'll come to TikTok. that in one second. Let me get uh, Professor Brahma Chalani and then uh, Jenny Padian, and, and also after that uh, Rajiv Dogra. Uh, Professor Chalani, look, I'm convinced that what we have seen from Galwan 2020 to now Tawang 2022 is part of a pattern being deployed by the Chinese to try and a grab land, b salami slicing, but at the same time. they're not bringing guns into the equation because it's a bit like i i know it's not a comparable example but it's a bit like what the pakistan terror machine does you keep the conflict on on slow burner you keep it on low boil you keep it sub optimal that it doesn't create like a 2611 kind of a situation but you keep it sub optimal so that the flames are continuing to burn that's what the chinese are doing with the lac they don't want guns in the equation but they're not shy of using clubs and sticks and machetes Zaka, you're absolutely right. The People's Liberation Army prefers aggression by stealth. For example, they redrew the entire geopolitical map of the South China Sea without firing a single shot. Now they are trying to replicate the South China Sea model in the Himalayas. In East Ladakh, they significantly changed the line of actual control in 2020 by stealth without firing a single shot. So similarly now they're trying to redraw the LAC in the Tawang sector. They they go to extraordinary lengths to avoid face to face combat, and there is reason why China avoids a direct confrontation with the Indian Army. The PLA is largely a conscript force. By contrast, India, with its all volunteer military. has the world's most experienced army in hybrid mountain warfare india's weakness is a reactive and risk averse strategic culture that is india's weakness as a consequence as you know india pursues an overly defensive strategy against an adversary that is constantly seeking to probe indian defenses mm-hmm. to find new openings for territorial expansionism remaining constantly defensive against such an aggressive foe imposes a huge burden on indian defense because a single lapse in anticipating or reacting to a chinese military foray can prove costly we saw that in ladakh you know in eastern ladakh in april 2020 yeah. when the chinese encroached on indian borderlands that particular lapse is still proving costly so Fortunately this time in Tawang the Indian soldiers were prepared and the Chinese were forced to beat a hasty retreat but i think time has come for the indian leadership to recalibrate this china strategy it's it's obvious that india's deterrent strategy against china isn't working it's not working I, it's and not i agree working. with you so i want to ask general kardian i think what the the most valid point that professor jalani cited and i think he's absolutely right is that look the chinese what they're trying to do is to change the status quo without having to fire a single bullet that's what they did in eastern ladakh that's what they're trying to do in tawang and forget about you know the india china line of actual control look at what they've been doing with japan with vietnam with indonesia philippines all the disputes maritime disputes in the south china sea they are trying to change the status quo without having to fire a single bullet the question general kardian is what is our response what are we doing to deter them from Zaka. doing that zaka this incident of tawang is not the first one that has happened nor will it be the last one that is my reading of the situation 
ever since 1962 these incidents have taken place some got highlighted like nathula in 87 sundrong in 86 and galwan in 2020 others were smaller ones did not catch the media eye now <clears throat> there are two views i am going to i am not going to discuss details of what happened on 9th of mm. everybody knows sure. it i am first going to tackle at the military level what does the army do there has been only one constant in from 1962 to onward that our army is always reacted that is our national policy if there is no defined line china don't accept it nothing stops us also from going across and capturing some hill let there be some pressure on the chinese now there is no pressure on them they choose the timing they choose the place they don't have to alert at rest of the line whereas we have to alert on the entire 3500 kilometers so no, we need ge- to general, change general, from reactive we captured the kailash range policy. general we captured the kailash range in august no, of 2020 what then happened after that no no they have been doing slamy slicing and all different parties are ruling there was a time when we were sitting on finger 7 for example we had a itbp yeah. post today you can't go beyond finger 4 it's not happened in the last two or three years it has happened much earlier and that has happened in other areas, except sundrong where we actually dominated them all other events we were on the reactive the second issue is it's a intractable problem i'll tell you why it is first there is no defined line normally in mountains the boundaries decided by the water geographical yeah so except in east sikkim where yeah. there is a there is a clear line chola nathula jailapla dokala all other places it is vague and it cannot be defined chinese don't want it to be defined because they want to continue uh, poking you they want to derail yeah. your economy they want to hurt your standing in the world the only way it can be solved is at the political level hmm. the leaders of the two countries meet and decide and negotiate now what does negotiation mean negotiation means give and take there we run into difficulty china is a one man rule he can afford to give whatever he wants in india the democracy forces the ruling party to take a hard line that's why we still today talk about taking back excise chain that 38000 square kilometers to take back from china i think it is in the dream world it is not practical they have made a highway there they are connecting to karakoram they are connecting to sea pack and onto the seas any thought that they will give up that line is out of the question okay so some other concession they might give sensible for two countries is if we want to make progress economic prosperity then resolve the issue and that can only be resolved through dialogue and dialogue again i told you there it is simple one man dialogue in india you can't the democracy gives a baggage of taking a hard line okay so no, it is I, a I, uh, I, I, i i i may not part. necessarily uh, agree with everything that general kardian is saying but yes there was this thought some years ago much before you know i i think much before this government came much before uh, xi jinping came to power if india were to w- willing to give up uh, aksai chin this was a west east swap then china will give up its claims on tawang but anyway much water has flown down the brahmaputra and the yangtze uh, since then but i want to before i go to rajiv dogra and victor gao uh, there is a piece of breaking news that's coming in this from new york where india remember is holding the rotating presidency of the united nations security council the external affairs minister jay shankar has hit out at china without naming china uh, he said this at the unsc He has said, and I quote: "Multilateral platforms are being misused to justify and protect perpetrators of terror." Now, clearly, the reference being to the China's role as far as bringing in its veto power, blocking resolutions in 12, 1267 Sanctions Committee against known terrorist individuals like Hafiz Saeed and uh, uh, Masood Azhar. Uh, China has been blocking the listing of a number of terrorists based in Pakistan. Uh, I want to play out Jay Shankar's uh, soundbite, and then I'll go across to Rajiv Dogra. When it comes to climate action and climate justice, the state of affairs is no better. Instead of addressing the relevant issues in the appropriate forum, we have seen attempts at distraction and diversion. On the challenge of terrorism, even as the world is coming together with a more collective response, multilateral platforms. 
are being misused to justify and protect perpetrators. Now, I want to ask Rajiv Dogra, yes, this is a very, very big issue between India and Pakistan. Of course, the role of China, its veto powers, its blocking ability at the UN Security Council. But I'm curious to know, what is our diplomatic strategy after Tawang 2022? Clearly, there's a pattern. You've heard from General Kardian, you've heard from Professor Chalani. What are we doing at the very least? And we don't know this yet. We're all awaiting the EMEA press conference tomorrow. Have we summoned the Chinese ambassador? Has a demarche been issued? Have we told in explicit terms to the Chinese foreign ministry? This is unacceptable. You cannot have a unilateral change of the status quo. Those are the words used by the Raksha Mantri in parliament. Well, uh, thank you so much. Yes, as you said, I've heard Professor Chalani. I've heard my friend General Kardia. And I've heard uh, you referring to me as Rajiv Dogra, which makes me feel so young. Normally, people call me Ambassador Rajiv Dogra. Anyway, uh, that is up to people. Uh, you are free uh, in a free channel in a free country. Uh, and that is the reason why we are having this debate. That why is the Indian option vis-a-vis -vis China not seeming to be as viable or as strong or as effective as China's counter moves or moves are. Now, let me give you a bit of history if you don't interrupt me. After 1962 and till 2013, the LAC was relatively calm except for two or three occasions which General Kadian has outlined. It started only in 2013. We must think why? Because in 2012, President Xi took over. And since then, LSE has not been calm. And since then, wherever China has stepped in and crossed the LSE, it has not gone back by and large. Be it Chumar, be it Depsang, be it in Doklam in Bhutan, or be it in Galwan or in Pangong So, and now they have turned their attention to Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, in none of these, <coughs> except today, where Chinese Foreign Ministry has said that it was the Indian troops which had crossed over. So, what do they mean by crossed over? Obviously, there is a message also there that there will be some further step by China on this issue as well. So, number one, diplomacy comes in when there is possibility of some effect and diplomacy did come in when there were talks both at prime minister level, external affairs minister level and our officers along with the Chinese officers held consultations off and on whenever such incidents took place. Whether they resulted in China bending over backwards, that is for everyone to see on the basis of satellite images. Satellite images tell us that China has not retreated very much. Yeah. It is still there in what we feel is our part of the uh, territory. Uh, so, so, diplomacy comes in when the other side is willing to give us, give up its objective and its objective is salami slicing so long as it is successful and after that, the next step if salami slicing is resisted. Hmm. So, we are very close to that next step. Okay, so sir, you are saying that we are close to that next step because the salami slicing is being resisted. I want to get a perspective from Beijing. Victor Gao used to be the foreign ministry spokesperson uh, many years ago. Mr. Gao, uh, there is also a view here in India that all of this is being done because we have seen these unprecedented protests against zero COVID. Uh, it was unexpected by the Chinese authorities and they need a bit of a diversionary tactic or something uh, to take away the attention of the ordinary Chinese people uh, from. Is this that diversionary tactic? Thank you very much for having me. With due respect, this is completely inaccurate. Uh, China is in the transition period from the original dynamic zero COVID policy to a new amended uh, model. And in this transition period, there are indeed high level of 
uncertainties and high risks. So we are in the middle of this. And China is as united as you can expect for any country in the world. There are no protests uh, in China now. Uh, all the cities are very quiet right now. And people are moving around, trying to get over this transition, as well as the uh, risks posed by the uh, COVID. Now, for the border skirmishes between China and the uh, India, allow me to say this. Whenever such uh, skirmishes happen, it is regrettable. And both China and India are urged and advised to disengage as quickly as possible and resort to diplomacy to solve whatever problems there are between the two countries. Secondly, as far as the territorial disputes are concerned between our two great nations, diplomacy is the only way out. So whenever there are difficulties or even challenges, we need to focus on the importance of diplomacy. Now, both China and India should be grateful that our two countries have decided that whenever frictions or skirmishes happen along the border, the militaries of the two countries should avoid using real military weapons or live ammunition, rifles, uh, machine guns, rockets, planes, etc. They should use non combative weapons to deal with this confrontation and then disengage as quickly as possible. I think both China and India should be grateful for the courage and the wisdom that the two countries have demonstrated, because eventually the territorial disputes which do exist need to be resolved in peace and diplomacy and negotiation. But, Professor no, Gao, I'm, I'm, sorry, a, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. You know, the problem with that argument is that, and it's not just in the context of India and China, uh, China is doing this with other countries as well, where it is by force, through military means, trying to change the status quo. And then whenever the other party concerned, it could be Philippines, it could be Vietnam, it could be Japan, in this case it's India, uh, stands up to it or confronts it or says this is not acceptable, then the refrain is, okay, let's go to the negotiating table. Let's, uh, let's uh, resort to diplomacy. But the original uh, act of trying to change the status quo is not through diplomatic means. It's by force. It's through military means. So that's the, the mismatch in the argument. You, may, you, you press the case through military means, and then you say, okay, let's now talk. That I don't think is acceptable, either to, uh, to the Indians or to the Japanese or to the Philippines. Uh, allow me to make a very quick point. We are focusing on China-Indian territorial disputes, but since you mentioned China and Japan or South China Sea, for example, let me be very quick. You know for sure that before Japan unconditionally surrendered in 1945, Japan sat on all the islands, isles, atolls in the South China Sea. Then. In August uh, 1945, Japan unconditionally surrendered. And do you know to whom Japan surrendered? All the isles, islands, reefs, atolls in the South China Sea. Japan surrendered everything to the Republic of China. And do you know that the U.S. military at that time assisted Republic of China to reclaim all the islands, atolls, reefs in the South China Sea? And Japan, uh, the United States, on the other hand, reclaimed whatever that belonged to the Philippines. And whatever that the United States did not take over for, for the Philippines was left over to return to the Republic of China. This is a fact. And at that time, in 1945, you know for sure there was no Vietnam. Vietnam was a French colony. There was no Malaysia. Malaysia was a British colony. There was no Indonesia. Indonesia was a Dutch colony. Philippines was not an independent country. Philippines was a colony occupied by Japan during the Second World War, reclaimed by the United States after the war. This okay. is the fact. In that part of the world, the Republic of China in 1945 was the only independent sovereign country. And we fought our way for the success of the Second World War. And it was up to the treaty signed between China, the United States and Japan for the unconditional surrender of okay. all the Look, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into that. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting again. But I, I don't Thank quite you. see. I don't quite see how that adds up in the context of India, China. Professor Brahmachalani, to respond to what Mr. Gao was saying. Well, <clears throat> this is uh, 
revisionist history uh, and and revisionist history is something that China excels at. But I think getting back to the original point that you were making, Zaka, as to how India can deter China, it's very important for India to recognize that the current belief that all it takes to deter China is strong military deployments. No, strong military deployments are necessary to deter aggression, but to be effective, deterrence must be spearheaded from the political slash strategic level by making China's aggression costly for it. This means India exercising its trade and diplomatic leverage. But instead of exacting mounting mounting costs that make China that makes China halt its aggression, okay. India is doing the opposite. It's helping China to reap rewards from its aggression. To give you just one example of how India is helping hmm. China to reap rewards. Right through this aggression that began in April 2020, India has allowed China to continue to reap growing trade surpluses with India. Okay. To the extent that now, in the last financial year, China's trade surplus with India overtook India's total defense budget. In other words, India is underwriting China's aggression as well as China's economic and military power. Okay, let me ask Shazia Elmi that because this is a charge you, that uh, the opposition has also been leveling against you. No, I mean, you banned a whole bunch of apps, banned a whole bunch of uh, you know smartphone manufacturers and so on and so forth. But the trade deficit between India and China has only increased. In fact, the trade, I think, was $115 billion, which is the highest since 2015-16 in the last financial year. If after Galwan, we're still continuing to trade with China in a way that we haven't over the last uh, decade or so, then what costs are we imposing on China? So, Zaka, two points that I've been wanting to make, and I'll make the first one brief because that's why that I wanted to come in earlier. Uh, the gentleman who spoke for China and uh, the Chinese policy, um, uh, I would like to speak. I would like to say that uh, the Chinese have indeed flouted uh, both 1993 and 1996 uh, um, uh, agreements. agreements yeah. You know, border peace pacts. So it's not, uh, it's, and there have been frequent uh, um, uh, provocative behavior, and it's all been done uh, not uh, because of India. But uh, as somebody just said, India has always reacted. Now, whether it's from Doklam to Galwan to now to now now situation at Tawang, if you look at the situation um, again, there has been provocation. Now, now the the the, the issue is where is this provocation? Why is there provocation? And to what do we attribute it to? I would uh, I would like to think uh, uh, realistically, and I'm not being optimistic when I say it's because of uh, a stronger India, it's because of India uh, ca calling out uh, China that uh, th there is deliberate provocation once again. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, we don't have to be apologetic about anything at all. Similarly, where, where we talked about trade, um, uh, you know, Nirmala Sita Ramanji, our finance minister, gave a statement today uh, in the parliament because these were the, uh, the these were the charges made by the opposition. Then, while the trade and the volume of it increased by some two thousand percent, it actually has uh, increased only to uh, one hundred and twenty percent or something like that. And the fact of the matter is, overall export, and we don't live in an isolated economy. Mm. Everything is connected. You know that, and we know that. So to to suddenly say and ask for no trade, uh, no exports, no imports, even if though we are uh, Chinese are much more than us in terms of uh, what uh, they, they get sure. from us than what we get from them. I, I don't think it's a very wise and a, uh, it can be a, a, a we can have a knee jerk policy to no, that. Sure, I, I agree with that. I don't think economy. you can put an uh, end to the trade or turn off the trade tap. And, and, yes, and uh, even if you do that, and another point, I don't think that's that going to change the Chinese behavior on the line of actual control. Yes, also pol the political behavior of the opposition in the parliament at this juncture does not help matters either because we have irresponsible statements coming from supposedly responsible leaders okay. from the opposition uh, calling out Agni Veer so, and using terrible language. So, so let me that ask Colonel Dahoon, let me call Dahoon. Defense Minister you know, and it, Minister you look at America the and, and they, are, they have a, as divided a polity as perhaps ours. But there is a consensus between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to China. 
And the most uh, glaring example is Donald Trump for all his aggression against China. You thought a new Democrat president would come in and change all of that. Mr. Biden has not changed any of Mr. Trump's China policy. He's changed a whole bunch of other things, but he's not changed any of Mr. Uh, Trump's China policy. Why can't we have a unified China policy? That is the, the single biggest threat that we're going to face over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Why can't Congress, BJP, opposition and government have a common uh, strand on this policy? Yeah, thank you so much. Like you brought such an important uh, question uh, for this discussion. Before I answer this uh, question, I just want you to take your mind back when we were negotiating in Galwan. The day we vacated Kailash Heights, after that, the response of Chinese for disengagement, uh, it has gone slow. It has gone slow to a point where we today uh, have not been able to get them on a talking table, negotiating uh, table or whatever. Coming to the next, uh, uh, one of the panelists had said that uh, we have uh, G20 presidency now with us. Well, come on, it is not elected, it is not selected, it is rotational. So one must avoid giving a narrative which is not correct. Coming to the next about uh, the uh, US, what they are doing and what we are doing, why can't we do the same? I must admit the U.S. Uh, democracy is a very mature uh, democracy. Here we have a case where after two years plus, we have not been able to name the country, leave aside anything else. At any international forum, we have failed to name China that they did this. We have failed to say that they are 12, 13 kilometers inside Indian territory and within the Indian territory, we are not permitted to go to the patrolling points. They have failed. They have tried to hide behind the screen of national security. That it is, it concerns national security, so it cannot be discussed. Okay. If national security cannot be discussed, are we going to discuss uh, Mandir Masjid? Okay. This Let topic me ask, is a uh, burning General topic Kardian and we need Steve to Obi discuss Staff, this. General Kardian, this is, so and I've been saying this for a number of years now, I think we have, we have a, a, an almost disproportionate obsession with the Pakistan question. I think our single biggest challenge is going to be China. Forget about the political divide. Even in the strategic community, uh, General Kardian, is there a unified view on how to deal with this challenge? Zaka, militarily, the army is strong enough. It is much stronger than what was a few years earlier. We can manage the problem. But managing is not solving the problem. Solution is beyond the pale of the army. It is much bigger. As I said in the beginning, it is between the two political heads of the government. Wherever it is easier for China to take decisions, it is not easy for a democratic leader to take those decisions. Because all decisions taken by the government are debated, criticized, and even condemned. Every parliamentarian who speaks in the parliament house normally addresses his constituency. We can do something more. We can uh, corner China on various issues. Two years ago, not two years, two months ago, there was a proposal by Turkey, UK, and USA in the United Nations Human Rights Council to have a debate on Western Xinjiang. Now, that was a good occasion for us to corner China. Okay. But we have said, I'm sure they must have valid reasons, I don't know. But uh, those reasons are not known to the common man. We need to be pragmatic. We need to put brakes on the trade. Hmm. 2021, our trade deficit with China is $73 billion. And trade volume is increasing. So what pressure are we putting on China? And that responsibility okay. lies with all of us. Okay. We all have... So uh, I'll give the final word to Ambassador Dobra because I, I'm really, really out of time. Do you buy merit in this argument that to take on China, to alter its behavior, or at least to impose its costs on the behavior we're seeing at the line of actual control, it's not just a military response. We need a comprehensive response. Yes, you've banned apps, but trade has increased uh, over 100%. In the, in, the, in the last two years with China. So if you were to make China feel the pain or the costs, as it were, as Australia seems to have done, what does India need to do?
Ambassador Dogra, that, that question is to you, yeah. Well, I, I think we have to be firstly realistic. Uh, we cannot switch off trade in items like pharmaceutical, electronics, the thermal power plants or even some of the telecommunication equipment because we become far too dependent on China. So unless we have alternate means and alternate methods, I think we would be heading for a major problem within on these vital mm. sectors. Uh, it was our mistake to be dependent on China, but now it is far uh, too much water under the bridge. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, uh, th th there has been talk that, you know, China is one man rule, so they can do whatever they want. Yes, they can do whatever they want. And that is why she has decided to do what he has been doing in terms of sl salami slicing. This has not happened earlier, okay. as I've already said. The second thing is that India is a democracy just like America, as you very rightly said. Yep. But in America, while there is a unity and uh, united uh, decision making in terms of, uh, let's say, China as a, as a mm. country to be watched, yeah. uh, so is it in India. But America does not bar debate. America encourages debate on foreign policy issues, both within okay. their houses of Congress and Senate mm. and outside in media. All right. I'm completely so out of we, time, Ambassador Dogra, Professor debate. Chalani, uh, Mr. Gao, Shazia Elmi, uh, Ms., uh, Colonel Dahoon, please, and of course, uh, um, uh, thank you very please much, up. Ambassador Dogra please and up. General Kardian. Thank you. I'm completely out of time. I have to wrap up this debate. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back right on the other side of this ad break, an exclusive chat with Chicago University Professor John Mir Scheimer, one of the most erudite scholars in uh, international relations right now. And I asked him, what is China's real agenda? Why are they continuing to indulge in this pattern of behavior? And more importantly, what can India do to emerge?